Hello and welcome. My name is Tom Pesek. I'm a senior liaison officer at the Food and Agriculture Organization's Liaison Office for North America, based in Washington, DC. And I will be serving as moderator our, of our, our event today. So on behalf of FAO North America, I would like to thank all of you for joining this session on reclaiming health through indigenous food systems, a discussion on the film Gather. Before proceeding with our formal program, there are a few important housekeeping items I would first like to cover. First and foremost, I'd like to advise you that this event is being recorded, and we've had about 1,300 people register from around the world to join this discussion, so there's clearly no shortage of interest in this topic and in the film. And we hope that you've all had an opportunity to watch the film, but in the event that you have not, the link will be live through Thursday, and we are also live streaming this event on Twitter at FAO North America. We're eager to hear from you, the audience. So to participate in the Q&A segment of this event, I would like to encourage all of you to submit your questions for our speakers in the Zoom Q&A box at the bottom center of your screens. And if possible, please specify which speaker or participant your question is intended for. Due to time constraints, I will not be able to provide full and proper introductions for all of our speakers. However, their biographies are hyperlinked uh, in the chat box here for you to, to see. And lastly, I would like to provide an outline of how our event today will be structured. In a moment, I will be inviting my FAO colleague, Vimalendra Sharon, to offer welcoming remarks. And thereafter, we have the very good fortune of hearing from the ambassador of Canada to Italy and permanent representative of Canada to the UN Food and Agriculture Agencies based in Rome. We will then have a traditional acknowledgement by Ade Romero Briones. We will then hear from Sanjay Rao, the director of Gather, and we will, we will also see a trailer of the film itself. And then thereafter, we will have a panel discussion with other speakers followed by a Q&A with you, our audience. And then to wrap up the event, we will have some closing remarks from my FAO colleagues from Lendra Sharan and Michaela Way. And we will endeavor to end our session promptly at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I now have the pleasure of introducing Lendra Sharan, Director of FAO's Liaison Office for North America based in Washington, D.C., to offer welcoming remarks. Lendra has served in his current role since December 2016, and he came to Washington from Rome, having served as permanent representative of India to the Rome-based Food and Agriculture Agencies of the United Nations. Vimalendra, the floor is yours. Thank you, Tom. And greeting colleagues and friends joining us from <clears throat> all parts of the world. We have uh, over a thousand registrants for the event today and that really speaks volumes for the interest that this topic has generated and that the film has generated globally. Because I find from the participants already joined in that they are from US to Sudan, to India, to Nepal, and to all over the world. So welcome all of you. And a very, very warm welcome to Ambassador Alexandra Bugailiskis. I don't, has she joined in? I think she will be joining us soon. And uh, She's the chair of the informal group of friends of indigenous people in Rome. And in that capacity, a very powerful voice in championing the cause of uh, indigenous peoples and the importance of indigenous food systems and food sovereignty in, in combating global hunger. As we know, there is no universally accepted, defined uh, definition of food sovereignty. And the closest that we get to understanding it is to see it as a specific policy approach to addressing the underlying issues impacting indigenous peoples and their ability to respond to their own needs for healthy, culturally adapted indigenous food, leading to the long-term goal of uh, food security. Gather the movie that we're about to see is an intimate portrayal of the growing movement amongst Native Americans to reclaim their spiritual, political, and cultural identities through food sovereignty. 
Though the film is around Native Americans, the sentiments expressed in the film, I think would hold true for indigenous communities around the world in every part of the globe. What impressed me really about this film uh, is that it's not a editorial putting forth a director's view on what he thinks about the indigenous food systems. Rather, it is building up of a narrative around the indigenous peoples themselves in their voices, in their perspective, in their sentiments. So it is an attempt to really understand them as they understand themselves. And that is really crucial in today's world as we build upon uh, understanding indigenous food systems and taking these systems along for ensuring global food security. In a recent newsletter that our office had published, Ambassador Bugaleskis has rightly, uh, in her statement, uh, put it, and I'll quote her here, that it is important that we do not speak for or on behalf of indigenous peoples, but that we create space for them to be listened to and engaged with and actively advocate for their presence and participation in the discussions and decisions that affect their lives and communities. I think nothing could be truer than this. We really, really have to provide for space and listen to them to understand them and stop prescribing. It is therefore an honor to have the film's director, Sanjay Rawal, here with us today, and along with him, some of the voices from the film itself. Join us at this special event, and it will give us an important opportunity to interact with them and to understand their perspective more closely outside the celluloid. So I once again welcome all of you to this event and I really look forward to an interactive and a uh, interactive session with lots of questions and lots of discussions. Uh, with that, I will pass the floor, virtual floor back to the moderator. Tom, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Finlinger, for those welcoming remarks. Before we proceed any further with her program, I would now like to invite Ade Romero Briones to offer a traditional acknowledgement. A U.S. Fulbright Scholar, Ade is the Director of Programs for Native Agriculture and Food Systems at the First Nations Development Institute. Ade, please, the floor is yours. Um, Ko Mahadan. I'm Kochiti and Kiowa. And this morning I am calling from Lodi, California, which is the land of the Yukut people and Miwok people. And I'm surrounded by rivers. And these rivers um, are pretty important right now. If, if folks don't know, we're having a lot of fires in California. And there's a train going by, so excuse the train. We're having a lot of fires in California and during these fires, it's important to acknowledge that indigenous people and the ancestors of my children and my husband's family have long taken care of this land. Um, and so I just want to acknowledge that we are in the lands, wherever you may be, are the lands of indigenous people who have also taken care of those lands. And the movie and our discussion is a time to acknowledge those lineages, those knowledge bases, and um, put forth a lot of the indigenous knowledge and connections that um, are going to be much needed in the coming years and future, our collective future. And um, let's just give some time and room for indigenous knowledge people in space in our discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ade. I believe we're still waiting for the Ambassador of Canada to Italy uh, and permanent representative to the UN Food and Agriculture Agencies in Rome to join us. And so it's now my great pleasure to introduce the director of the film Gather, Sanjay Rao. Sanjay is a director and producer widely known and acclaimed for numerous films, including Food Chains, a film about tomato pickers in Florida. Sanjay is a leading advocate for equality and works to develop a wide variety of strategies to help nations improve the quality of life for marginalized workers and people. 
Sanjay works tirelessly to educate audiences about philanthropic topics all over the world. His film 3100, Run and Become, won several prestigious festival prizes, had a robust theatrical release in the United States in 2018, and is opening in traditional theatrical engagements across Europe and Australia in 2020 and 2021. Sanjay, thank you so much for joining us today to discuss your latest work, Gather. And let me start by congratulating you on yet another master work and on directing such an eloquent and inspiring story of hope and promise, one focused on solutions. That's very, very kind of you, Tom. And thanks to everyone who has logged in to watch the movie over the last few days. And first and foremost, to FAO for hosting this event. I would like to really pay acknowledgement to our partners in this film, the First Nations Development Institute based in Longmont, Colorado. You know, the documentary film industry started in 1929 with um, a film called Nanook of the North, done by a non-Indigenous filmmaker named Robert Flaherty, uh, who went to Inuit land and made a film that in hindsight was deeply exploitative. And it's been a a trend ever since for a number of non-native, non-indigenous documentarians to go into communities that they really had no knowledge of and begin portraying them without that deep cultural and spiritual sensitivity. So as a non-native American filmmaker, I was you know, very cautious about even approaching this topic, but very much this was a, a project you know, in, in collaboration with the First Nations Development Institute. It was their leadership, it was their work in indigenous communities that gave us access to the stories that were portrayed in Gather. And it was their sensitivity to the political and spiritual and cultural aspects of food sovereignty that truly allowed us to make a film that we believe is solutions-based. You know, the timing of today's panel couldn't be more um, apropos. Um, most of you had the chance to, in a sense, watch Gather before the rest of the world did. But starting today, the film is available on iTunes and Amazon in the US, Canada, and in the UK. And we hope that this uh, film will, will spark a lot of important conversations, not just about our food system, but around the original stewards of food systems all over the world. So thank you very much. Excellent, thank you very much, Sanjay. If I may, I'd like to, to ask a couple of questions. Um, I think it's, it's safe to say that we're all aware that you've helped to tell the stories of other indigenous peoples and communities in some of your other, your other films, including but not limited to food chains, which focused on Oaxacan and Chiapan and Guatemalan indigenous peoples, as well as your film 3100, Run and Become, in which you delve deeply into Navajo and Kalahari San Bushmen running traditions. Could you describe for us your approach and building upon what you were just saying, uh, as a non-Indigenous director, what your approach was to making Gather, to directing Gather, a film about Native American food sovereignty uh, and about those on the ground working to revitalize Native foodways? I, ha I haven't been a documentary filmmaker for that long, uh, maybe 10 years or so. And before that, I worked in human rights in a lot of countries in Central Africa and Southeast, Southeast Asia. And the success of those projects was very much dependent on my ability to stay out of the way as, as much as my ego would allow me to, and to allow the storytelling abilities of people on the ground to carry their own projects forward. So I hope that comes across in Gather, where we deliberately recognized all of the characters, including Elsie Dubray, who's here joining us in the panel, um, as experts themselves. We felt that we didn't need outside voices. We didn't need voices from outside these communities to tell us what was going on within those communities. And I think that I've, I've, I've been fortunate to carry that through line through my other films and treating characters with the ability to portray their narratives in the ways they know best. Excellent. And Sandra, you've been making films uh, for about a decade now. Could you tell us what was different about this film from your previous ones and, and perhaps what you might have learned in the process in, in making this film? You know, all of my films have, I guess, have been 
pretty adventuresome, particularly 3100 Run and Become, where we, we kind of sneaked into Botswana and spent time with San Bushman activists and hunters. But I've never really worked on a more challenging film, I should say, than Gather. Um, even though it's very much a solutions-based film, the stakes couldn't be higher. You know, for people who watch the film, you know, we're, we're in the words of one of our characters, Nephi Craig, we're, we're on the, Native peoples are on the other side of the apocalypse. And, you know, they've been through a horrific last few hundred years. But at the same time, those few hundred years are but a blip, um, a moment in their 10, 20, 30,000 year history. And to find characters with the resiliency and the ability to speak in a sense for millions of native peoples around the world wasn't easy. And, and for, in that aspect, you know, I'm grateful to First Nations Development Institute. It was their work with these characters that really gave us access to the voices we had that spoke with such wisdom, depth, and clarity. And that's a rare thing for any documentarian to have access to. You know, people who have that authenticity, who can speak with such heart and such soul, be they 17-year-olds like Elsie Dubray was in the film, or elders like Twyla Casador, pictured in my background behind me. Sanjay, without further ado, I think it's only right and proper for you to, uh, to introduce the trailer of the film. So please, cue it up for us and uh, tell us a bit about what we're about to see. Well, this, this trailer gives a, a little snapshot to what the film is about. It starts, of course, with the modern destruction of Native American peoples on Turtle Island, but hopefully it presents a, a really positive, powerful approach to their revitalization of traditional food systems and their understanding of the place of those food systems in a quote, modern capitalist world. Thanks Sanjay. Without further ado, here's the trailer together. We saw the world end once, that whole life was gone. Now we're on the other side of the apocalypse. The different wrongs that have been done to native peoples are just so sickening. I mean, they even had slogans like, kill the Indian, save the man. That's genocide. Millions of people all across the Americas systematically wiped out, starting here on the East Coast. That's the reason that we don't have that relationship with some of those traditional foods anymore. What's popping? I see onions. Yeah, we have uh, red onions, yellow onions, matcha, corn squash. You ready? We're salmon people. Like, what do we do? If our salmon don't come back. What I've come to understand is if we want to maintain our culture, then we have to have buffalo as a vital part of our communities. What we're doing is reintroducing our young people to the land, the food, and our traditional ways of healing. Working at the farm has brought a lot of healing to my life. I've been clean. 16 years, June now. I learned to heal through harvesting our traditional food. We're celebrating Apache Foodways in a kitchen that was built by Apaches for Apaches. It's this movement among all indigenous people that they're finally, they're listening. And it's like music when you hear the drum, it's calling you. And it's Mother Earth, and Mother Earth's heart's beating. And she's talking to all of us that we need to do something. Let's inside first, I think. Let's get right there with the corn. Let's see if we can see. Excellent. It's now my great pleasure and honor to introduce Ambassador Alexandra Bugaliskis who serves as ambassador of Canada to Italy and permanent representative of Canada to the UN Food and Agriculture Agencies based in Rome. And she also serves as the chair of the Group of Friends of Indigenous Peoples in Rome. The ambassador has served abroad as ambassador to Syria and high commissioner to Cyprus, ambassador to Cuba and Poland. In Ottawa, Canada, the ambassador has held a number of senior leadership positions. And in August, 2017, she was appointed as Canada's ambassador to the Italian Republic. Without any further ado, Ambassador, we're very excited that you were able to make time to join us today. The floor is yours. 
Well, thank you very much, Tom. And in, and in fact, I was there all along. I thought it was a great example of how Indigenous people feel when they're outside the room and hearing others talk about them. And that's exactly how I felt today. So thank you. It's such a wonderful feeling to know that so many people have joined us today uh, for this great film. And I know I'm going to have to prolong the anticipation just a few more minutes. I wanted to mention National Indigenous Peoples Day, uh, we're, which we recognize, of course, in Canada. And in that message that day, our Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, called for the elimination of systemic racism, including discrimination towards Indigenous peoples from all Canadian institutions. And he reaffirmed Canada's commitment to working in partnership with Indigenous peoples to build a renewed relationship. That partnership extends to organizations like the FAO, where dedicated people like Jan Fernandez de Lernau, I'll hear a little bit later, and Vimalendra Sharan, who was already speaking, uh, provide an important platform to give voice to Indigenous peoples. And today's film and discussion is just another example of their outreach. And I want to thank them for also ensuring a strong gender balance amongst the speakers. This is really impressive. When the Friends of Indigenous Peoples Group was launched in November of 2019 at the FAO here in Rome, we made it, as Tom said, a first principle that we would never speak for or on behalf of Indigenous peoples. Instead, we see our role very much as creating new space for dialogue. And there's nothing like a good film to stimulate knowledge and debate. But I wanted to take a moment, it's gonna sound a little strange, but I wanted to give a shout out to my Irish colleagues because I also read some good news today and uh, they were competing in the World Lacrosse Games. They stepped back aside in order to allow the Iroquois Nationals to compete. And the Iroquois Nationals are actually a better team, sorry, but they're third place in the world. But why weren't they competing? Because they were not being seen as a nation. Well, that changed and Olympic committees around the world, including Canada, agreed with uh, this move to allow them to play. Uh, it's unbelievable that this still happens, but I'm so, so happy. So while the Irish are the heroes of the story, the lesson is universal. Let's stand aside and let the real experts play. And today's panel discussion on the documentary Gather offers an occasion to learn more about the food systems of Indigenous peoples in Canada and the US and their contributions to our food, nutrition, environment, and biodiversity. In Canada, we know, however, that because Indigenous peoples are three to five times more likely to be food insecure than non-Indigenous Canadians, and because Indigenous women are particularly vulnerable, we recognize that COVID-19 will disproportionately impact First Nations, Inuit, and Métis communities. Food insecurity is also a critical issue for Arctic and Northern peoples. So we're taking action in Canada to both engage and support Indigenous, Indigenous and Inuit peoples. Canada's vision for fostering long-term reconciliation is to promote and enable their contributions to economic and social development. So we are co-developing science projects with Indigenous partners to support Indigenous-led agricultural systems. And our new food policy for Canada includes an emphasis on Indigenous and local food systems and provides funding for local food projects. And in response to COVID-19, we're also dedicating additional resources to improve public health. It's never enough but it is at least a recognition of the need to start filling that gap. So let me con conclude by noting how the global pandemic has exacerbated the existing levels of inequality in food security, access to health, and economic opportunities faced by Indigenous peoples. And as we move towards 2021, a UN Food Systems Summit, it is critical that Indigenous leaders be at the table to share their holistic approach to food systems, health, and sustainable development. Today's webinar provides another opportunity to inform ourselves and to highlight the important contributions of Indigenous peoples to our food security. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much, Ambassador, for those words and for your critically important leadership and that of Canada on these issues, including by chairing the Group of Friends on Indigenous Peoples in Rome. So moving on to our, our panel discussion, we all know that behind every film, there are a number of core individuals, in addition to the director, of course, without whom it could not have been made, those whose commitment and dedication helped make it happen. And we're about to hear from some of the individuals who were integral and instrumental to making Gather a reality. I'd like to start by introducing Mike Roberts, 
who uh, is and has served as president and CEO of the First Nations Development Institute since 2005. Previously, he served as chief operating officer for the First Nations Development Institute until 1997 and then returned in 2002 and was appointed president by the board in 2005. In the interim, Mike spent five years in private equity working for a telecommunications fund and for an early stage Midwest venture capital firm. Mike has worked at Alaska Native Corporations and for local IRA councils. Mike serves on the board of First Nations Development Institute and is chairman of the board of First Nations Oista Corporation. Mike, can you share some background for us about First Nations Development Institute for our audience and your role as producer of the film? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, where what's probably more germane to the conversation today is the work of First Nations Development Institute in our food systems initiative. Um, First Nations has been a grant maker for 25 years and about five years in, we, we did a reflection of the kinds of grants we were making to communities throughout the US and found out that a large portion of our portfolio, 50 or 60% was going to food systems related projects. And in some ways that was a surprise to us. We are kind of a blocking and tackling economic development agency, really looking at asset based development and putting native folks back in control of the assets they own. Um, but when you look at the intersection between food and economic development, it really should be no surprise that we're in this business. You know, even poor folks in the United States spend upwards of 50 or 60% of their, their annual income on food. And in, in, in reservation communities throughout the U.S., much of that money is, is exported to border town communities. And so First Nations really looked at the work of food systems as a way of, of economic development, of recapturing um, dollars and hopefully tumbling them over a few times back in the local economies. I think we, we knew all along that this was going to be bigger than just economic development. We, we knew as Indian peoples who worked here at First Nations that um, food touches so many other things in, in Indian people's lives. This is, uh, these are our, you know, origination stories. These are our kinship with our fellow creatures. These are our stewardship models of the places that we've lived for time immemorial. And we, it was not lost on us at First Nations that these were as equally as important as the economic value that we were talking about. And so, you know, that history of food and food systems and the, and the communities that we've worked with and worked for um, showed up. And so when Sanjay and one of our funders came around asking us to be involved in this film, it was, it was, an, easy, it was an easy yes to, to, to make because um, we have been working with these community members and, and celebrating the genius of indigenous peoples for a very long time. And, in our conversations with Sanjay, um, he was willing to, to play along and help us tell the story of the intentional destruction of food systems in the United States and the, and the, the hard work and the, the, the knowledge keepers who've kept traditional food systems alive. So we're excited to be part of this process. And Mike, could you tell us a bit about what messages you're hoping uh, viewers take away from, from this film? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, a couple. One is um, that the the poverty and the and the and the, the you know the difficult position that Indigenous folks are in has been a, an, an intentional process. That you know, in order to subjugate Indigenous peoples in this country, we actively destroyed their food systems. This was you know this was uh, much we learned from the Civil War marches to, to, to the sea by the Union Army, the same, the same strategy was used to destroy food systems and intentionally starve Indians into, into surrender in the West. And, and so I, I'm glad that you know, Sanjay was very good about making that happen. I think the other piece here is, and I think it's been alluded to a couple of times in this conversation, um, that Native folks can speak for themselves right, that when we do our work at First Nations, what we do is we invest in local solutions to problems in the local communities. And we, we recognize that the people who are living these experiences are the ones who create solutions. And oftentimes they need a little bit of 
um, of capital and probably a little technical assistance, but really the, the genius and the traditional ecological knowledge and how to solve problems is there. And I think that that's what the film portrays is that there is a great deal of human capital and reservation communities and they're applying real solutions, both modern and traditional to solve problems of food sovereignty in native communities. And I think that, that Sanjay did a great job of, of capturing community voice and community genius. Thanks, Mike. I'd like to bring a day into the, the conversation. And once again, Day is the Director of Programs for Native Agriculture and Food Systems at the First Nations Development Institute. A day, the, the film in many ways focuses on your, essentially what's your life work, your, your life's work as Director of Programs uh, for Native Agriculture and Food Systems at the First Nations Development Institute. Could you tell us a bit about what you wanted this film to, to deliver? Um, and how you see this happening, and, and tell us a bit more about your work uh, as the director of programs. Yes, so I do have the honor of working with um, all of our grantees who are working in the Native Agriculture and Food Systems program. And I don't think there's, there's a better job. I mean, I get to work with farmers from all across the mainland United States, Alaska, and Hawaii. And I would say, really, these folks are not only working on food, but they embody all of the history of like our lands and our country and probably the global experience of indigenous people. Um, indigenous farmers are not only farmers and land stewards are not only working on regenerating our land bases, but they're fighting for access to fishing, to hunting, to um, seed sovereignty. I mean, the gamut of indigenous issues that um, are currently upon indigenous people are, are all felt on the food system, whether it be environmental degradation, whether it be the resurgence of um, different strains of food, whether it be like, localized food systems, trying to figure out local supply chains. And it's all done under the pressure of economic systems. Um, and really what comes out of this is like brilliance. There's just a lot of brilliant people in this field. Um, and I just get to support them, which is, um, I hopeful, hopefully came across in the film. Um, we at First Nations are not the genius, but as Mike said, it's the people who are on the ground growing those seeds and feeding the people who are genius. And that's really what I hoped um, Gather would showcase. And I think it did a great job. Thanks, today. And if I, if I could, I'd like to follow upon a point that the ambassador made earlier and was wondering if you could tell us um, what impact you're seeing uh, the COVID-19 epidemic having um, until now? Yeah, I've, well, to me, it, it's like a catch-22. Um, there's two sides to the coin. On one hand, we see a lot of media that's focusing on the need for um, food in these communities. At First Nations, we were definitely in the thick of the breakdown of supply chains. And I never heard countries and communities um, talk about supply chains like I did in COVID-19. Like I think everybody has heard a conversation about supply chain breakdown. And when Indian country is outside of that supply chain, um, the breakdown is very stark. And we've had communities that um, were without food and we're trying to figure out how to get it. But on the other hand, we have a lot of communities who leaned into their traditional food systems, who recognize that um, they existed prior and they fed their communities prior to any um, modernized supply chain. And there was an actual resurgence and uh, an interest, unlike I've seen in any of this work before, on um, reestablishing traditional food systems. And that was pretty, that's pretty important because if there's not that conscious um, effort within the community, 
one person is not a community food system. Right? It's a community that's a community food system. And we really saw the resurgence in um, the excitement of how those food systems would serve us now. And I hope I'm not putting you on the spot here, but um, I think it'd be fascinating for us to hear if you could an example, a concrete example of how, um, how the community worked to reestablish traditional um, food systems. Yeah, well, I think we see the example, well, anybody can just jump on social media and see all the excitement about indigenous seeds um, happening. But more importantly, like establishing a traditional food system, like that's work, right? You not only have to um, extract yourself from an economic system that influences almost every part of our being from the way we think to the way we transfer food to the way we grow food, like extracting yourself in that system is really hard. But the most exciting thing is, is I saw indigenous people who are still growing traditional foods trying to figure out ways to get those foods to other communities. More recently, we had um, a group of Southwest farmers who provided traditional crops that originally came from these communities back to these communities. So we had like traditional squashes, traditional corn actually being transferred back to where the first community gave to the second community. The second community actually returned them during COVID um, as a way of not only thanks, but as a way of um, acknowledging that connection. And I think that that happened also with um, the Irish community. I know the ambassador mentioned our Irish brothers and sisters. I mean, back, who knows, hundreds of years ago, the um, Choctaw people helped a lot of the Irish people in, in their famine, their time of famine. And more recently, they've donated thousands of dollars to the indigenous people in our time of famine. Like that, that is like unheard of. It is such a beautiful sentiment and I get emotional about it. But those connections as dormant and as um, quiet as they have been, they have basically reared their head and created these long trade routes that have always been there and just been sleeping. Irish eyes must really be smiling, listening to all of these uh, wonderful references to, to the role the Irish have been playing of late. So Adé, would it be fair to say that, that the COVID crisis has um, generated some opportunities to reassert um, native or indigenous food systems and uh, to reestablish supply chains that existed long ago? Yeah. and. Um... I think the Irish example to me just speaks to what I, yeah, you know, like reassert, I don't even know if that's the right word, right? But they've been just asleep, they've been dormant, but they've existed in our memory and in the types of foods we eat. And it's just like a matter of waking up. I'd like to say they're, they're, we're woken up, um, not exactly woke, but woken up. And many more people are paying attention, which is exciting. What a great story. Thanks today. I'd now like to bring into the conversation Elsie Dubray, who's featured in the film, and is, she's a member of the Cheyenne River Sioux Nation, and she's currently attending Stanford University as a, an undergraduate. Her analysis of lipid structure and buffalo meat, which her family raises and harvests, took her to the Intel World Science Fair, where she placed fourth in the biology division in 2018. Elsie is committed to using the resources of Stanford's Biological Sciences program to further her research of traditional indigenous diets as a way to combat the diabetes epidemic in Indian country. Elsie, welcome. I was hoping you could tell us a bit about how the messages in this film can help to engage young people around these issues, including not just, of course, native, um, but, but non-native, uh, communities and, and young people. Yeah, um, Kihani Washte, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for having me. Um, I guess when it comes to youth, I've, it's really interesting because 
as a young person who's been given such a such amazing opportunities to be able to to speak um with opportunities on this film and to present my research i get the question um a lot about being a youth i and I first would like to preface with the fact that I cannot speak on behalf of all youths, um, all indigenous youths. Um, but to me, I think we see a lot of young people in the film. I mean, we have Twyla who is an um, absolutely incredible elder and, um, and some other older folks, but we also see this real resurgence in the younger generation. I mean, Sammy and other members of the ancestral guard are only just a couple years older than me and maybe uh, and multiple younger than me. And when I see the film, I think it's really cool to me because the film highlights these voices. And while it's a really, while it's a big part of our cultures in indigenous communities to respect and hold our elders to the highest level of respect, it's a very, colonial structure to silence our youth. And that is something that has happened through the acts of colonization is youth voices don't matter. Youth voices are silenced. Um, you don't know anything unless, you're, um, unless you've gone to school and you're some big fancy CEO of something. And that's simply not true. And that's especially not true in indigenous communities where we have the knowledge of our ancestors from before we're born. And I think the film does a really good job at showing that it's youth. It's, there are many youths who are in a way the forefront of these, this food sovereignty movement and that it's important that we nurture the passions and um, ideas of youth who are navigating in this world and who are going to be the next generation who carry this on and pass it on to other, um, the next generation of youth. And so um, that's, that's what I see um, in this film. And I'm, I apologize if there was a second part to your question I missed, but yeah. No, not at all, thanks. Elsie, um, and if I could, um, if I could ask, what so what what sorts of actions would you like to see young people, given as you say they're at the forefront of this movement? What what specific actions would you like to see them taking, and and perhaps also what opportunities do you see on the horizon for them to make a big impact on food sovereignty? You know, just speaking up. I mean, there are, I know so many young people, people my age or younger, um, or just a couple years older who are doing incredible things. I mean, it's not like there are just these select few people and I'm one voice who's been given incredible opportunities and been um, given a platform and uplifted, but there are so many other people who are doing incredible things, other indigenous youth who are doing amazing, really important things in their communities and for the rest of the world, um, who don't necessarily receive that kind of attention, um, especially widespread. And I think that is not to their own fault. It is that, like I mentioned, there's a culture that puts older voices, um, and not necessarily elder voices, but um, that silences youth voices and demeans them. And so I think there's a, there's been a semi-recent shift in, in that culture, in that there are a lot of people looking towards the, the brilliance of youth, um, and looking to them for answers and for ideas, including them in conversations. Um, and so I think with that shift, it's important that youth try to to take that risk you know and and to speak up and to speak up anyway you know and put those ideas out there because there are people listening now and um there are more people listening now people who have power and people who can support and um people who can really uplift and i've been so fortunate to have been um uplifted by people like Ade and Mike and Sanjay and First Nations and so many countless others in every realm of anything that I've done, people have been so supportive of me, but it's important that 
um, that that's happening continuously and across the board. Um, and so I guess to, to youth, I just encourage them to speak up and to actually, I mean, it's, it sounds so cheesy, but it's so true to just mm -hmm. say, like, follow your dreams, like follow your passions, because that's all I did was I had something I was interested in. And now this is, this is what people have supported me. And I couldn't have done that alone, but I didn't go out and do all these incredible unknown heard of things like there are so many people like me doing the exact same thing and i just i want i want everyone to be able to be supported like i have and i um i just encourage people to go out there and do that on both ends thanks elsie your your enthusiasm is palpable and contagious um i'd like to hear a bit more though about the dynamics you were describing in terms of the role that, that young people are playing and how that's shaking things up in terms of traditional roles and perhaps uh, generational changes. And I was wondering if you could talk about how this role, this active and, and leadership role that young people are increasingly playing in this space, how that's being received by um, older generations or, or elders. You know, every time that I go speak at a conference, either presenting my research or talking about um, the film, it's elders who come up to me and it's elders who tell me that they are so proud of me and that I am one voice in the, in the next generation and thanking me for what I'm doing um, and that I'm making ancestors proud and that I'm making them proud and to keep going. And it's their support that's what keeps me going. And it's my passion and my pursuit of what I'm doing that gives them hope. And that is a reciprocal relationship that has existed for time immemorial in our indigenous communities. And that's something that through the acts of colonization or colonialism, that's been trying, that's been broken down. That, that has been tried, um, people have tried to destroy that and divide um, our own communities. And our communities are not perfect. That, I mean, their harm has been done um, and these relationships need to be rebuilt. But I have received nothing but support from older generations in my indigenous community and the indigenous community at large. So that has really reinforced to me the idea that this um, age hierarchy is a really colonial construct that has worked to dismantle our efforts of um, re restoring our communities. Um, and so I don't see problems or resistance so much in my communities. Um, I mean, you have tribal politics, which is messy uh, always, but as far as like an elders versus youth, that traditional relationship has stayed pretty consistent, at least in my experience. And that's something that I don't think can be broken. Um, so I, I don't entirely know. I'm not very great at ending, <laughs> ending my ideas, but I will just cut myself off. Well, see, um, I think we could listen to you all day. Thank you. I'd now like to open this up to more of a conversation among all of you, um, Elsie and, and Mike and Ade and Sanjay. And, and Sanjay, if I could start with you, the film has a very simple yet powerful title. And I wonder if you could tell us what about the word gather encapsulated or uh, captured um, that which you hoped the film would convey and communicate? Oh, that's a great question. I mean, to, to be honest, again, my, my modus operandi in making this film was to try to stay out of the way as much as possible and capture what I saw. One of our indigenous producers, Sterling Harjo, actually came up with the title. And he understood the, the deep resonance that that had with Native communities. He also understood that it was a word that neither had a romantic connotation, like if we called I'm just making this up right now, if we call gather like the harvest of the silver moon or something like that. Um, it neither had a romantic uh, context, but at the same time, it was easily translatable into 
many, if not all, indigenous languages that, that, that we knew of. Um, so again, the, the title came from an indigenous person. And I, I would just add there this is, um, that when we talk about gathering, like it has, it has, it's a heavy word for indigenous people. When we talk about gathering on ancestral homelands, whether that be roots, whether that be food, whether that be hunting, like indigenous people have lost so much access to their lands that when we say gather, it's not like, um, an activity that's taken lightly. We have indigenous people all across the world in, in the United States, even in California, still being prosecuted and still being harassed for gathering, whether it be seaweed, whether it be roots, whether it be deer meat. And so like gather on is sort of like our call to continue those activities wherever we may be not only for our own bodily sustenance, but for the health of the world. Like we, you know, like indigenous people need to continue gathering. Yeah, you know, I, I would love to add, I mean, I think I love the, the kind of double meaning of the word too, because when we look at the food systems renaissance in Indian country, we are really talking about a community effort, not, I mean, the film was nice enough to show individuals, but I think what we, we was lost a little bit was this is a this is a community activity and you know the idea of gathering right the the the, the process of coming together i think was was re, is really an important part of what is happening in indigenous communities in the united states around the, the food systems and food sovereignty movement elsie did you want to come in on this why not? Um, <laughs> um, I guess um, when I didn't have much of a grasp on what the concept of food sovereignty was prior to my participation um, in this film. And I mean, when I was approached about the film, they were like, we think your family has done a lot with food sovereignty. I'm like, wait, food sovereignty, what? Because I thought food sovereignty had so much to do with agriculture. And I had this very um, complex understanding of what agriculture really meant. Um, but so once, once I was kind of able to break down that wall within my own experience and kind of dive into the world of food sovereignty, indigenous food sovereignty, I realized just how, um, holistic the concept um, really is. And so when I think about uh, the word gather, in addition to everything that uh, Mike, Sanjay, and Day have said, um, I think about how in my own experience, food sovereignty has really helped me um, like unite with other um, other indigenous people working on quote unquote other indigenous things because it's all interconnected. Um, and I think it can be in Western society that really attempts to compartmentalize everything and put everything into these tiny, neat little boxes um, and kind of sever the connections between everything. It can be really hard to navigate um, indigenous issues because those tiny little boxes don't exist. It's this big, messy, beautiful web. And so I think the term or the concept of food sovereignty kind of helps gather that all together and at least it has for me and um when we talk about cultural restoration certain people will say oh language right revitalization needs to be like our priority and other people will be like oh but um restoring our food system like has to be uh number one or we have to address the health disparities that's number one um but when we talk about efforts of food sovereignty, we're talking about all of that at the same time. And it really gathers those ideas, unites all the people on all of those working at the forefront of all of those quote unquote separate ideas and really creates this united indigenous force um, that um, is really something to be reckoned with and that I think is a really beautiful thing. So that's just kind of an on the fly thought. I've never given much thought to the title <laughs> um, until now. So that was a really um, on the fly analysis, I guess, but that's, that's what it makes me think of. Thanks, Elsie. And if I could ask a question, um, well, maybe starting with uh, 
with Mike a day and and Elsie, but certainly Sanjay, please chime in. I think um, for those of us listening to all of you, it's quite clear. I think that there's quite a chemistry between all of you, and that you're you're kindred spirits, if you will. And um, clearly, it's it's virtually impossible for a director to conduct her or his work without first establishing personal relationships of confidence and trust in order to become part of the, the inner sanctum, if you will, or to be let in, as it were, to be granted privileged access to a subject or to a group of characters or individuals. And uh, Sanjay has repeatedly emphasized that his role was uh, upon being granted access uh, to, to stay out of the way and let uh, people tell their own story. I was wondering if you could all describe for us how this relate, these relationships of trust and confidence developed, um, how your initial interactions uh, went and, and, and happened in such a way that you were all fully certain that you were working with the right people and with the right director to help tell this, this really special story. I mean, I'll start. Um, you know, we. Uh, I think this is an incredible story, and I think um, there there could be lots of directors that that could that could tell the story. But I think one of the things that we we got with Sanjay was um, early conversations about what was important to us as First Nations and the the movement that we were part of in the food sovereignty movement, um, and what was going on and what was kind of the, the mood and the story that was important to us if we we're going to give him access to our our partners in, in Native communities. And, um, you know, I think lots of times Native people are listened to, but it's very rarely that people are heard. And I think Sanjay actually heard us when we talked about what was important to the, this work. And, and, and early on, you know the the conversations we had about the importance of community voice and people telling their own story and, and speaking for themselves not speaking being spoken for you know some of the early cuts we saw of Sanjay's um, film work really reinforced to us that, that he heard us and 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 therefore he let the community folks to speak and be heard as well I'll add. Yep. yes I'll add I um... So story, Sanjay, we actually filmed many other communities besides those that are in the film. So we have a lot of footage. Um, and, you know, going into this, I was, I was working for First Nations. First Nations decided to do this. I work in food systems, so like I was point person. Um, and so there was much, uh, you know, nervousness about working with um, a non-Native filmmaker. But we went to one community and the little boy Z, which, and it was my community, the little boy Z said, I really want to be, be a filmmaker. Um, can, I, can I see the camera? So the filmmaker gives him the camera. And then Z says, I really want to try this, like try to be a filmmaker on my own. So like how much do one of these cost? And Sanjay's response was like, oh, you probably want to get a different one. This one's about $20,000. And when he said the camera was worth $20,000, I knew it wasn't a regular camera, which made me realize that um, Sanjay did his best to ensure that this movie not only had the best equipment, but it had some of the best producers, filmographers, photographers in the industry. And I, he, he had me there. And of course, my grandma liked him and fed him well. So I, I he had me. <laughs> Grandma's blessing is always key. Um, Elsie, anything you'd like to share? Yes, I have a lot to say on this end of things. Um, so I guess <coughs> um, Mike has known both of my parents for a long time. So when I got, I can't remember if I got an email from Mike or Sanjay first, but when I shared it with my parents, they knew what was going on because Mike Roberts' name was um, mentioned. And 
so that was my like first like I wasn't really so on edge because my parents knew and approved and respected all of that um and then once the film got started Sanjay showed up to my science fair with a million cameras and I think Mike was there too and um so we were just kind of thrown right into that that's when I first met them and they were there all day and that was fun um it was a little interesting being at the science fair with the whole film crew but I mean everybody who's been involved has really treated me like a person and um I never felt weird I mean as as weird as it was to have a million cameras and the mic things and stuff like they would ask I mean they were like right there with me they were getting hyped up about the science fair they were asking me questions and about about things that didn't have to do with like they weren't telling me can you stand this way or like tilt your chin up it, it was nothing like that they were asking me like if I was nervous they um they were commenting on the girl next to me and like oh did you see that judge like things like that and then um i went and spoke at the first nations food sovereignty summit last um september i think it was and i met a day for the very first time and she was so warm and welcoming and sweet and I, I that was my first time like going to a conference or anything like that alone I was in Green Bay by myself but I had said goodbye to my mom who helped move me into college um, for my sophomore year at Stanford and so I was kind of nervous and a little, I'm, I'm not great with being by myself and when I went there the people treated me like I was family and I didn't feel lonely and I felt respected and like what I had to say meant something, um, which is, has been proven to me time and time again, and yet it's still something that means something every single time. Um, and since then, I have received nothing but support from everyone involved. I mean, Sanjay sends me happy birthday texts and like that's that's not like the average filmmaker thing i mean i don't have much experience with filmmakers i don't besides sanjay but that's he is a very real person and the relationships that have that i have built with the people involved in this film have been extremely meaningful to me and so if you get anything uh from any of this um what i'm saying is that this is not your average film, I wouldn't say, and that there are some really important and valuable relationships, at least to me. Thanks, Elsie. Sanjay, anything you'd like to add? I'm just getting, I'm getting too emotional. So, <laughs> thank you, everyone. I should, I should, I, I'm going to dissolve into a puddle of tears in a second, so I should let you ask a more, uh, another question of somebody else. Well, I'd actually like to take um, a moment I hope he's, uh, he's on with us. Uh, I'd like to ask our FAO colleague, Jan Fernandez Laranoa, who heads up FAO's uh, Indigenous Peoples Unit in Rome, to perhaps briefly describe his work and FAO's work in supporting Indigenous Peoples food systems and Indigenous Peoples traditional knowledge. Jan, are you there? I'm, I'm, I'm here, I'm, I'm learning and uh learning so much. Thank you so much for the discussion. And uh, um, of course, I would like to greet uh, all of you. I think that it, there's many things that, that we are doing, but let me start, Tom, by saying that um, you cannot work on indigenous food systems without putting in the center indigenous women. And if we consider indigenous women and uh, we put them together, um, they will have, it will be a country with more population than countries like Pakistan or Nigeria or Brazil. And this is something that people do not realize. Uh, there's more than 476 million indigenous peoples in the world. If you put them together in a single country, it will be the third most populous country in the world. So when you look at the institutions like FAO, and FAO is very much a knowledge institution um, uh, with a mandate to eradicate uh, food insecurity and hunger. But when you look at uh, where is the knowledge that these indigenous peoples, these 476 million indigenous peoples from across the world, speaking more than, than 4,000 languages, uh, where is this knowledge in the UN institutions? Where is this knowledge in FAO? So a lot of what we've been doing is actually putting uh, indigenous peoples, like I think like Director Sanjay has done in this film, at the center of the discussion. 
Still, there is many committees in FAO that the member countries uh, still are not opening to indigenous peoples. Still, uh, many of us, we give prevalence to scientific knowledge considered by uh, somebody who has graduated from the university. But when you watch the movie uh, Gather, and then you see the amount of knowledge that every single person in the movie has, how they share this knowledge, there is more sharing of knowledge in, uh, in the whole movie than in many of the universities that some of us we have attended. But yet it goes unnoticed. So in 2018, uh, we wanted to challenge this. We organized a high-level expert seminar on indigenous people's food systems from all over the world. We got uh, indigenous leaders, men and women, coming from the seven sociocultural regions to describe how they feed, they feed themselves. And let us remember, Tom, that the, the eldest form of culture in the world that has come to our days is the original people in Australia. They have more than 60,000 years of existence and knowledge. But still, we don't consider this knowledge uh, in, our, in our policy discussions. We don't consider this knowledge. So a lot of what we are doing is trying to change uh, uh, mentalities, trying to change perceptions, trying to challenge the mindset that we've been all uh, indoctrinated during our education. That's why the work that um, Ambassador Bogailiskis is doing with the group of Friends of Indigenous Peoples is so central and so fundamental. Because we managed to gather ambassadors from complete different countries that come together to learn and to listen directly to indigenous peoples. We are currently um, with a methodology that we developed with a number of institutions and indigenous peoples. We are right now documenting uh, more than 16 indigenous food systems from across the world. And I think that, that like, like, um, like all of you were saying before, that the title gather will not be more appropriate because we don't talk, for example, in, in my unit, uh, we don't talk of food production. We, took, we talked of food generation, which is actually gathered, is hunted, is fish, but where the centrality of the capacity to generate that food is in the environment and in the cosmogony that influences that environment, not necessarily in humankind. So it's a major shift that we are trying to influence and we are trying to do this evidence-based. In 2021, there is a UN uh, Food Systems Summit. And we, one of the things that we are trying to do with FAO, we are launching now in September a global hub, a center of knowledge on indigenous um, people's food systems. There's more than 16 uh, institutions, indigenous academia, research centers. And what we are trying to do is to gather evidence, like the one that has been shown in the film, to make sure that the countries, when they will meet in New York, they include indigenous people's voices and they include the knowledge that they've been gathering for thousands of years. It's a major undertaking, but we are very fortunate to work with so many indigenous women and men from across the world and with the support of so many countries and ambassadors like Ambassador Bogailiskis that is actually uh, helping us in putting indigenous peoples and their knowledge at the central of the policy debate. But the, the movie is fundamental in all of this. And again, I want to congratulate um, uh, all of you for so much sharing of knowledge that you have done. Thank you so much, Tom. John, thank you so much. I, I, I'm really glad that you were available to join us and to, to tell us a bit about the important work that you and the unit are doing in, in Rome. Moving back to the, the film for a moment, um, and perhaps I could direct this first towards Sanjay, and then others can certainly chime in, but um, in an effort to try to connect some dots um, and, and cognizant of, of the fact that context is important, I wonder if you could reflect on uh, how this film relates perhaps to a larger set of events or debates, processes or dynamics that are unfolding and ongoing beyond the communities and individuals featured in this film, whether there are any linkages you see to other ongoing or contemporary movements or, or efforts? That, that's a great question. And, and I'll try to answer it as briefly and as succinctly as I can. I mean, most of the world was organized in village structures not too long ago. You know, somewhere around the Crusades, business people in Europe realized that that there was a lot of money to be made from organizing expeditions under the banner of religions. Um, to plunder and to conquer. These tactics were, were perfected in incursions into the Basque country, into Wales, and really set the template for the modern foray to Turtle Island, to North America, Central America. 
to extract wealth in multiples that economies had rarely seen. And that wealth was primarily based in the land, if not entirely based on the land. You know, there were silver mines in Spain, there were a large cash crop, you know, dreams in the Caribbean and in what's now in North America. Those forays were financed heavily by national governments and business people, and it required first and foremost land. Um, that land was obviously stolen from native communities in North America, and labor was required to make those multiples. And that labor had to be free, so native communities were enslaved. And when those populations began to be decimated by that, that labor slash genocide, you know, there was a, a capitalistic push to start bringing agrarian laborers by force from Africa. We've seen the exportation of that model then to India, to Southeast Asia, to East Asia. So the modern food system, the modern economic system is very much a, a result of what happened in indigenous communities in North America in the 1400s, 1500s, 1600s. At the same time, we've seen those corporate tactics get exported across national borders and national boundaries. We've seen that in Indian country in North America, and most importantly, we've seen the resistance that native communities have formed, the tactics that they've developed against those corporate and transnational pushes into taking away their sovereignty, taking away their human rights. Um, we see in North America right now, lastly, you know, the increased awareness of Black Lives Matter, of the legacy of slavery in those early capitalist economies, and the residual effects of those today in policing and government structure. But at the same time, those early economic incursions were very much based on land. And so the political landscape for you know, indigenous communities is very much tied to the destruction and theft of those lands. And we, we, we try to portray that and gather through the, uh, through the angle of food systems. But even though the film doesn't explicitly decry certain policies, the political reality of this fight is very, very timely. Thanks, Sanjay. Mike, Elsie, Ade, would any of you like to, to come in? If not, um, Sanjay, I was wondering if you could describe, I'm sorry, Mike, please. No, no, I was just laughing that we weren't even jumping. I think he did a good job. Thank you, Sanjay. Sanjay, I was wondering if you could describe for us uh, over the course of the two year period of uh, this, this film being developed and, and, and filmed, if there was a specific moment when you realized you had something special. You know, I, I, I think I realized that in the first meeting where I discussed, or we discussed the idea of this movie with First Nations. You know, I'd, I'd been lucky in past experiences of getting access to great characters, but that access came through years of relationship building or months of being on the ground. But as I began kind of throwing out concepts for idealized cast members for this film, it was apparent that First Nations, Mike and Aday knew these folks personally. And so, I mean, that, that's a, it's a, it's a, Elsie's a great example of that. You know, when we were looking for youth voices who were also involved with food sovereignty, you know, Mike had known Elsie since her childhood. And at the same time, maybe at that stage, Elsie didn't even realize <laughs> that she was that deeply involved with food sovereignty. So we, the, the, the personal relationships that First Nations had developed over decades you know, once they began revealing those and the depth of that, I realized that, you know, we could make an incredible film and we could make it in, in a, a way that would be visually arresting and cinematic. Thanks, Sanjay. I think our audience has been waiting patiently and I think it would be appropriate at this time to start um, posing some questions to, to all of you from our audience. And um, given the interest of engaging youth, I think we'll, we'll take this to a new level by fielding a question from someone who is 10 years old. And this question comes, and this is for any of our speakers, this question comes from Sana Hutchins of Washington, D.C., again, who's 10 years old. 
And Sana says, uh, in watching Gather, um, that wondering how kids can help to play a role in protecting indigenous people's food systems uh, and what, what young people should be telling their friends, teachers, and communities. Yeah, I'll, I'll take a stab. Um, you know, First Nations did some work a couple of years ago um, on looking at the narrative that Americans believe about Indian people in the US. And the, and the primary narrative that folks in the US have about Indians is that Indians are invisible, right? And I think that when we talk to teachers and youth, there is this hunger for a real curriculum about our history. And I think the best advocates for the engagement and the demand of that curriculum are the people who are going to be subjected to that curriculum themselves. The, the, the 10 year olds and 12 year olds and 15 year olds who wanna know more and who are hungry in this um, Black Lives Matter BIPOC awareness of our community to insist upon hearing the real history of this country. Thanks Mike, would anyone else like to come in on that? Yeah, I, um, I'm the mother of a 12 year old and um, she goes to school in the state of California. And when she was in fourth grade, she had to do a mission project, which she had to create a model um, of the Spanish mission. And it was really hard for us. She's California native. Um, you know, her family came from a mission system, which wasn't a pleasant experience at all. And my daughter had to create the mission of which her people had to go um, against their will. And so um, because it was so hard to do, um, her, her, her classmates recognized the emotion and the stress it was causing her. Um, and together um, with her and her friends, they had a long discussion about why it was so uncomfortable for my daughter. And she was one of the only native kids in her class and she wouldn't have been able to have that discussion if there weren't other kids willing to sit with her and say, you know, we really need to talk about this. Like this is making somebody in our class really uncomfortable and stressed and we don't like seeing that. And so when you, for a 10 year old to recognize that stress in another student and to say something is really important. And so I encourage you to recognize when other classmates are being stressed or in the situations where the history being taught is really uncomfortable and say something. And that was a really good question, so thank you. Thanks, Ade. Elsie or Sanjay, any, any comments or thoughts? I guess I would just say that it's really cool and really encouraging to hear a question from somebody who's 10 years old and this like, enhanced awareness um at the at such a young age is really ho hopeful to me um even though i'm fairly young myself i mean i've got a decade on this young individual and so that's this is really cool to me and um i think it shows this kind of i mean this isn't somebody having awareness starting like right now in the the shape of like the quote unquote political climate of um, of the United States and, and elsewhere right now, um, where people are having this aha moment at age 54 or something and saying this, or maybe I need to start um, uplifting BIPOC voices. Maybe, um, maybe I need to start caring about some of these issues. I mean, this is a 10 year old who's already asking and trying to engage in really early anti-racist allyship. And that gives for a long time to develop that, um, to develop a real active allyship and anti-racist way of living and being. And the fact that that's not happening at age 60 when there's a lot of damage that has been done, that get, there's a lot of room for growth as a collective, I think, because of that. And so, um, I guess just heed the advice of 
uh, a day and Mike and whatever Sanjay is going to have to say, but I think it's just really cool to recognize that this is a good track to be on as a 10 year old. <laughs> and I think it's awesome. <laughs> Likewise. Thanks, Elsie. Sanjay, any thoughts from your side? Everybody covered it so well. Thank you. Great. And so I've got a question here from Marcy Cockrell, uh, who says that the film was really powerful and uh, thanks uh, for, for making it and making it available uh, for the audience. And Marcy's question is, what can people who don't identify as indigenous do to support indigenous food systems and indigenous food sovereignty? And this, this obviously can be to, to any one of you. So whoever would like to, uh, to take it first, please go right ahead. Okay. Um, there's, um, I'll just be, I'll try to be quick. Um, this question has come up in a few different panels and many just different discussions when I talk with non-native friends at Stanford and things like that. And one of the biggest, um, things is recognition of how important land is in this discussion. And so, um, my, like response to this question is always um, like land back. And that is, has in the past been see, seen as this sort of really radical notion of like indigenous people in this country wanting to steal land back. And that is a very like colonizer take on what this move, movement um, really means. And there, it's really not um, some sort of hostile, aggressive, um, colonial idea of stealing land from anybody. It's about returning land to those who know how to take care of it. And it's not about kicking anybody out or leaving anybody behind. It's about doing what's best for the land and everybody who's on it right now. And so I encourage people to look into um, what look into the greater land hashtag land back movement. Um, but that also really comes down to a really local, uh, regional specific. There's no one size fits all answer to this question. Um, it's, I mean, besides just universal support. Um, but the best way I think a lot of people can support is to look into, okay, A, do you know whose land you're on right now? Because if you don't, that's, that's step one. Um, step two, how can you support and um, be a good guest on that land? Sanjay talks a lot about, um, I'm, I'm, I won't let him, I won't try to answer it for him, but he talks about being a guest um, where he lives in New York and he does a really good job in that. And what, what is he doing to deserve to be there? And so how are, how are you taking care of the homelands of those people whose land you're on that was stolen from them? How are you supporting their active communities? I can guarantee wherever you are, you're surrounded by some indigenous people and you are for sure on some indigenous land. So what are you doing to actively support that land and those people? And it's like the first and best thing you can do is where you are now, support that community um, and those people, I would say. Thanks, Elsie. Great, great answer. Would anyone like uh, to add to that? No? You did a great job. <laughs> Agreed. Here's another question. Um, so as we know, in, indigenous peoples are key stewards of our natural resources, biodiversity, and nutritious native foods. And uh, indigenous foods and traditions can help expand, enrich, and diversify our diets and nutrition sources. What can be done to promote a heightened sense of awareness of and recognition of the critical importance and contribution of indigenous people's knowledge and practices. Um, Sanjay does, does this question well, but I'm gonna start. Um, you know, when we think about our modern diet, a large majority of those foods come from indigenous communities, from chili to tomatoes, um, and it's important to recognize that these are 
the brilliance and like intellectual property of many indigenous people. First, that's like important to recognize. And the other thing is a lot of our indigenous food systems are in direct competition with the modern food system. So, so like in the California Delta where I live, for example, right, it's all been transitioned to um, soy and corn. I think uh, I think Dave's having some connectivity issues. Sanjay or anyone else, would you like to come in as we uh, wait for a day to to reconnect? Yeah, I'll I'll add. I mean, I you know it, it was expressed earlier that when you look at um, biodiversity on this planet, that most of that biodiversity remaining is in the hands of indigenous peoples, and so we're we're, we're clearly the good stewards of this planet and this ecosystem this very fragile ecosystem that we live on and i think people are realizing more and more how how fragile this ecosystem is i think that we're often mistakenly believed that when folks showed up on the americas that this was this pristine landscape and in fact it was a, a landscape that was that was highly managed by the people who were here for um the different kinds of harvesting and gathering they needed to be doing in order to, to create their food systems and and they had you know sophisticated belief systems that that helped them um pass on information and knowledge um and and deep scientific knowledge that they passed on from years and years of observation and experimentation and hybridization um, in the Americas that they, they manage. And I think this happens, you know, everywhere we find indigenous peoples. And so I think this, this heightened awareness of the deep science that indigenous peoples own um, needs to be respected because I think we are learning every day um, what, what folks know and how it can help um, with some of the, the, the problems we're having now, especially with climate. I, I'll, I'll just say one thing quickly that just is a corollary to what Mike and Aday said. You know, if you look at our, our own peoples 500 or 1,000 years ago, very few communities were nearly as nomadic as most people are now. I mean, my people from East India, Vimlendra's people, didn't travel 12,000 miles away to inhabit new lands. We evolved deeply complex and important relationships with our environment, and that had a direct impact on our genetics. For example, if, if you were born in a northern Arctic climate and you couldn't process high levels of fat, for better or for worse, you didn't survive enough to, trans trans you know, to transfer your genes onto subsequent generations. Our bodies developed genetic specificity to specific foods. But if we go back, even in you know, a couple hundred years, we can see how the modern food system has completely shifted away from that ancestral diet. Most of what we eat is just given to us by the supply chain. It's not really something that our peoples have developed any sort of relationship with. And so as, as a person living on non, in, in, a, in a land that wasn't native to my people, you know, it's beholden on me to figure out what my place is on this land and how I can bring in my own food traditions and begin to research my own relationship with my family. Thanks, Sanjay. Would anyone else like to add to that? If not, we have a related question from Lourdes Orlando. She says, thank you so much for sharing your stories with the world and for allowing us to see the struggle being undertaken to reclaim food sovereignty by indigenous nations. I was wondering how the public sector can create an enabling environment to support indigenous food systems more systematically. Are there commonalities missing across reservations? This is a day, and again, apologies, we have internet issues, we have fires here. Um, yes, so one, I think there's, in our, in our program, the Native Agriculture and Food Systems Initiative, we have hundreds of projects that we work with, all the way from the more traditional indigenous food system, like the Oneidas and the Haudenosaunee, who are using, who are like 
using their traditional planting sticks all the way to the more um, structured agribusiness where they're, they're creating commercial project products. Um, and so systematically buying from indigenous producers helps the entire food chain, right? So a lot of the people who are producing the products eventually support the traditional food systems. And so like whenever there's an opportunity to purchase products from indigenous communities and indigenous people, we should. And so there's um, websites where we can find a lot of these indigenous products like the IndianAgFoods.org. There's hundreds of indigenous products that are created by indigenous farms, producers, and traditional folks all across the nation. And the second thing is, um, you know, there with the new onset of like interest in indigenous foods, there's chefs, there's, um, you know, communities that are trying to learn about indigenous foodways. And what we're seeing is this, this mass um, movement to go gather indigenous foods. And we're saying, wait, you can't do that without first learning. I mean, you can learn about the foods and you can learn about how to gather them, but it's part of a larger ecosystem. And so you really need indigenous participants. And so learning how to gather and hunt and fish the foods that indigenous people eat really require like a larger knowledge base that indigenous people have. And so like, you can't go gather all of the seaweed, you know, knowing that maybe in a couple months, those indigenous people need it. So we have to be really conscious of the food system, the not only the foods, but the, the environment that these foods grow in and who participate and are in relationship with them. That's really important. So it's one thing to just learn about the food, but it's another thing to learn about the, the ecosystem and the knowledge behind it. Thanks very much, Ade. Before um, turning to each of our speakers to ask them to leave us with a final takeaway message, uh, I wanted to see first if um, either the ambassador or our FAO colleague, Jan, would like to make uh, any additional comments. I'm not sure if, uh, if they're still connected to us, but if they are, please feel free to take the floor if there's anything you'd like to to add. Jan, please. Well, thank you, Tom. I, I think the, the, the movie, the, the documentary, does a great job in showing the, the diversity of indigenous foods that are often neglected by the mainstream uh, supply chains, food supply chains. I mean, if we look at the world today, one of the most tragic things that is going on is the overdependence we have of three crops to provide more than 50% of all the kilocalories needs of humanity. We are talking of maize, uh, we are talking of wheat, we are talking of rice. But when we uh, do research with indigenous peoples on the ground and we analyze with them uh, their indigenous food system, uh, just to give an example, we have indigenous communities in India that only in the first year of sifting cultivation, they generate more than 200 food items. Um, many of them uh, not known. They are wild, edible, semi-wild. But if we look, if we now uh, stop the, the, the discussion and we go to our kitchens and we count every single food item that we have, the different types of food items, I think most of us we will not go beyond, beyond 30 food items, 40 food items the most. So we are talking of uh, indigenous systems of knowledge capable of generating more than 200 food items that very often are not being taken into consideration in the mainstream discussions at global level. And this is a major loss for humanity and of course for indigenous peoples. So this is something that I think the, 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 the movie that, um, or the documentary that Sanjay and, and colleagues have put together really puts in the front line of the discussion. And it's certainly very timely now when the, the world is preparing uh, the next summit on food systems. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Jan. I'd now like to turn to each of our speakers to ask each of you uh, in a minute or two to tell us what your key takeaway message is for our audience. And perhaps I could start with you, Mike. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, for me, 
you know, the, this this movie and this opportunity is, is about um, the importance of 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 knowledge, right? And and not just like current academic knowledge, but deep understanding of place and environment and custom and tradition. Um, you know, it's, it's you know, I think it was Elsie who talked about and and a day who talked about that that we're not just extracting bits and pieces of knowledge that we're talking about a whole belief system that 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 works together in harmony whether it's religion or philosophy or agronomy that these things cannot be separated into distinct rights to be sold off and i think that when you look at indigenous food systems you're looking at a systems approach to in this case feeding our people but more importantly that this is just is not is deeper than just producing calories it's about you know a way of living on this earth and about being in um harmony with not only each other but but our other um brethren in the in the animal world and the, the plant world and that when we start looking at this in this way there's an opportunity for us to share with the rest of humanity a way of living and being that that makes a lot more sense in the way we're living now excellent thank you mike a day could i turn the floor over to you Yes. Um, <clears throat> so one, I think it's important to recognize that um, in wherever you are, indigenous people exist, right? Even that basic concept that indigenous people are here and they exist. I don't know how many places I've gone where they've said, well, you know, there's no longer indigenous people on these lands or they're, whether it be in the city or a rural community, like there's this idea that there's still this idea that we don't exist, but we're here, whether we, we're in larger, if we've melted into urban populations, whether we're um, in that lone house that, you know, used, used to be Indian land, like indigenous people are all around us. And it takes a, a little bit of effort to find them. And it takes a lot of effort to listen to us, right? We have a lot to offer. We have a lot to share. And I think now more than ever is the world needs to start listening to indigenous people. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you, Ade. Elsie, could I turn, turn it over to you? Yeah. So like Ade was saying, indigenous people still exist and a lot of people don't seem to recognize that. And when they do recognize that they hear these horrifying health disparity statistics, or it's always, um, talking about poverty and all of these, I mean, very real challenges in our communities, but our communities also, as the film likes to document, hold a wealth of knowledge and a really, really rich cultures. Um, and so one thing to always keep in mind is how, how these narratives about Indigenous people, whether they're things you're hearing or um, conversations you're having, are are framing um, are framing Indigenous people. And I encourage people to look into like a, a progressive narrative versus a declension narrative. This has come up of something I talked about in a film class. And, and historically, Indigenous people are always there's a storyline, story arc, and then Indigenous people end up down here. Indigenous people are not down here. And so it's something really important is to look at and what this film shows indigenous people like this, going like this, that's the storyline. And that's how our communities go. That's, that's, that's what's happening. And so it's important to recognize that. My second point would be more specific to food sovereignty. It's really important to consider that ultimately, as with everything, this comes down to relationships and relationships and relationality is not some like romanticized word. It's something deeply complex and philosophical and scientific all in one. And it's um, how are I something when I think about my involvement and I think about other people's involvement is how am I moving with this in integrity? How am I honoring my relationship with the land, with the buffalo? Am I being a good relative? Am I upholding their integrity? Am I being exploitative? That's not my intention. Are you supporting indigenous communities in an exploitative way? Um, that's not supporting an indigenous community. Um, and how, how am I operating to live up to my responsibilities to have good relationships um, with 
everyone here, um, be them human or non-human. And so that's another thought um, to consider. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much, Elsie. Um, Sanjay, I think it's only appropriate that we have you offer your final words with the audience as a nice bookend as, as director of this, this great film. You know, th thank you so much, Tom, and thank you to the FAO for, and Michaela Way for helping to host us today. I mean, I, I'm grateful to Mike, to Ade, to Elsie, to the other members of the, the cast of Gather for teaching me so much more about myself. Twyla Casador, who's in the film, is uh, of the San Carlos Apache people. She developed something called the Western Apache Diet Project, where she went to elders and asked them if they could remember what was in the pantries of their elders. So she went to elders in the early 2010s who were 80, 90 years old and asked them if they could remember what their great parents, great, great grandparents cooked for them. And I took that exercise to my own family. I went to my mother and father who came from villages in West India and South India, respectively, and had them remember what their grandparents cooked for them. And I got more of a connection to my past from that one conversation through food than I have through going to thousands of family gatherings. So many of our own family's histories have been trampled on by modernity, trampled on by um, a transactional view of the world. And I've learned through my time with Elsie, Ade, Mike, and others that the relationship I need to have with the land I live on, with the people that I have relationships with, need to be much deeper. I need to look at things as, as their people always have. I'm a steward of the land that I'm on. I'm a steward of the relationships that I have. And I need to start acting with that responsibility rather than looking at things so self-centeredly. I hope that's the message that people, non-Native people get from Gather. I hope that the message that Indigenous people get from Gather is, is as deep as the characters in our film. And so I, I, I thank you guys for this opportunity. Thank you, Sanjay. And, and thank you, Elsie, Ade, and Mike as well for, for helping to tell this story and shine a, lot, shine a light rather on these critically important issues. Uh, it's now my pleasure to invite Vimlinda Sharon, the director of FAO's Liaison Office for North America, to take the floor again to offer some closing remarks and then to introduce our, our colleague, Michaela Way, to, to wrap up the session for us. So without further ado, Vimlinda, over to you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, for me, uh, watching the movie and uh, listening to all of your talk, I think it's been a pretty much a roller coaster ride of emotions. And uh, uh, I think uh, you know multiple emotions come in. It's, it's when you watch the movie and listen to conversations that we have had today. It could be sadness, anger, fear, anxiety, frustration, disgust. But at the same time, what also comes through is a lot of compassion, a lot of love and gratitude and uh, hope. And I think uh, those are the positives, the four emo positive emotions that come, especially the emotion of hope is where, what I really want to take back with me. Uh, for me, uh, normally for all of us, when we host these webinars, you know, the way we judge the success is uh, actually one criteria is how many people registered, how many people are you know, participated. But I think what really mattered to me today was the fact that a 10 year old participated and uh, also that uh, she had the courage and she had the uh, strength to voice her opinion and to put up a question. And uh, I, I think uh, in that one gesture, I think uh, the success of today's event uh, it can be uh, in a way defined. So I really think we had a wonderful conversation. I hope it's not the end of the conversation, but rather the beginning of a beautiful journey from here ahead. Uh, to me, the biggest fallacy is that the word tradition has always been seen as something backward. And the word science is always seen as something forward looking and something modern. And I think that is where we are making a mistake. 
uh, traditional can be very scientific. It's not necessary that tradition is backward. And the sooner the world realizes, sooner the policymakers realize that tradition can be a very powerful tool in building policies going forward, I think we will be able to capture much of uh, what we have lost over the uh, generations. Uh, sadly, that realization is not coming through. And we are still looking at traditional as being uh, backward. I, I thank all of you uh, today uh, for joining us. Uh, Sanjay, uh, Tom, Michaela, Elsie, Mike, Ade, uh, Jan, Ambassador, uh, Liskes, and sharing with you your thoughts and your ideas. Uh, it was fantastic to hear all of you and to learn from all of you. And I really hope that this conversation will uh, go forward. But before I end, uh, I think uh, it behoves that I must uh, remember and thank uh, the dozen tribal nations that thrive along the Anacostia and the Potomac River watersheds. And that's where we are, at least FA North America is sitting and working from. And the fact that uh, we must also acknowledge that Washington DC itself uh, sits on the ancestral lands of the Anacostas and the Picatway and the Pamunke peoples. So at FA North America, we are really humbled when we do this, uh, the conversations around indigenous issues. Uh, we have had a series of meetings actually throughout July and August uh, with various organizations and leaders and people from indigenous communities. And this is part of that series, which all will culminate in October in a, uh, in a one day seminar uh, from where we hope to come out with some sort of a statement uh, on indigenous food systems, their importance, their role uh, in, in ensuring global food security. Uh, Michaela has been a consultant with us now uh, for a couple of months and she has done a fantastic job in bringing together all of you in bringing together the indigenous community in North America, both in US and Canada, and in uh, helping us at FAO North America understand the issues around indigenous peoples. So uh, uh, hats off to her for her, for her fantastic work and uh, also to Jan for his support from Rome. Uh, for the wonderful uh, team that he has in Rome uh, at a headquarter, the Indigenous Peoples Unit at Rome, and they have been doing a fantastic job supporting us. So thank you all of you uh, for being with us, the panelists, the people who have uh, asked questions, and uh, there's a plethora of questions which have not been put forth actually in the Q&A and also in the chat box, uh, which uh, rest assured we will share with uh, everyone and uh, encourage people to write back to you all directly with their thoughts and ideas. Uh, I think this is a recorded session which will obviously be available in public domain for people to follow. So uh, this will, we'll try and keep it all alive. That's, that's my uh, uh, short message. And with that, let me uh, pass the floor to Michaela for final words uh, and a final thank you to all of you. Michaela. Thank you very much, Director Vimlender Sharan. And I recognize that Ambassador Bugaliski is still with us and I know that you may have to go to another meeting. I just wonder if there's any closing words that you'd like to offer. I'm putting you on the spot, but I pass it to you. I just want to thank uh, everyone for joining us today. Um, I think it's so important just to listen and I've been listening very intently and there are, there's a great amount of questions and chatting going on. So we'll be reviewing that as well. I want to thank uh, people like Vim Lendera and, and, and Jan for the work that they're doing at the FAO. It's so incredibly important. And already, even in the short time that I've been here, the last couple of years, I've seen such a change, such an opening, uh, and such a thirst. When we do hold the, uh, the meeting of the Friends of Indigenous Peoples, it's amazing the turnout that is that we get for all of our meetings and uh, that's not usual because <laughs> these are all extracurricular you know items um, because people realize that the knowledge base uh, within the hands of the indigenous is so incredibly important at this juncture so thank you again 
um, for informing uh, me so much and for joining with everyone else today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for joining us, Ambassador, and we're very grateful for your presence today. Jan, I wonder if there's, if I may pass it to you, if there's any closing remarks that you'd like to make before I wrap up. I only have two words to say, and it's thank you. And uh, I can send them in Spanish, I can say them in Spanglish or in English, but I just mean to be, I'm very grateful to be with you and thank you for, for the great uh, discussion. Well, igualmente, it's mutual, and thank you. And thank you, Ade and Mike and Elsie and Sanjay, and thank you for giving us all an opportunity to listen and to hear today and continued on in the movie. And I'm grateful that this is a recorded conversation so that those who are unable to join with us today but would still like to listen will have an opportunity to do so. And thank you to all the people and the places who were part of this powerful production and for, for sharing it with us. Um, thank you, Ambassador Bugaliskis, for making time and for sharing your statement at the beginning and for being flexible and, and uh, understanding in that moment of on the outside listening in. And thank you, Tom, for moderating and for your continued support since I've been here in January. Thank you, Director Vinlendra and all of my colleagues at the FAO North America office for your unwavering support and willingness to engage and expand these dialogues and um, venture into this conversation with North American Indigenous peoples and to prioritize these conversations. And thank you to the Indigenous Peoples Unit in Rome and to the unwavering leadership of Jan Fernandez de Reynoa and the continued work that the Indigenous Peoples Unit and the group of friends are all leading. It's a tremendous honor and great privilege. And I also felt tremendous waves of emotion in listening today. And I'm grateful to all of you. And, and as Ade and Elsie and Mike have all said, it's, it's incredibly important for the world to be listening to the brilliance of indigenous peoples and indigenous peoples community and the knowledge base there. And I hope that we can together continue to change the narrative and with the leadership of the indigenous peoples at the front. So my deepest respect and gratitude to all of you. And I hope that we meet each other again and continue to tend our relationships to one another and all of those around us. Take good care, everyone. And thank you so much. Back to you, Tom. No, I don't think I could have said it better myself. I think we should end with your words. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.